I'm Neil, and this is A Cup of Hope, the show where I drink a cup of coffee and talk to people about some of the messy and difficult areas of life, areas where all of us need some more hope. Let's do it. Night Live. So glad you've come back again. Uh, last week was fantastic in our, our relaunch for season two. This is episode two of our second season and uh, overall episode number eight. We've tackled subjects like mental health, um, uh, alcohol and drug addiction, pornography addiction, um, various different things, physical health, all things that, things that we all struggle with and uh, areas that we need more hope. And I think we all would agree that money is one that we're just continually come around to various struggles in, in all of our lives. There are places where it's a huge stress and there are times maybe that it's a little easier. Uh, interestingly, money I think is the only thing that we struggle with on this level that we think our answer is usually, if I just had more of it. You know, think about someone who's struggling with uh, alcohol or drug addiction. When they're in their right mind, they're not thinking, well, if I just had more alcohol or I had more uh, meth, I would be okay, I'd be better off. I'd be able to sort this all out. The answer in our money struggles is not more, but we trick ourselves into it. 41% of Canadians say that money is the biggest source of stress in their life. Has that changed in our COVID-19 world? I highly doubt it. I think it has ramped it up for a lot of people. So tonight I'm joined by some friends of mine, David and Rebecca Van Noppen. They're from the Ottawa area and they run a business called More Than Enough where they do uh, financial coaching and uh, mortgage brokering and uh, help people with taxes, various different services, but the, the heart of what their work is helping people who have money struggles with financial coaching. So our heart's really connected on that issue. And I think tonight you're gonna love our chat because they're just lots of fun. And uh, there's some practical stuff in there, some good teaching, and just some um, good heart stuff in there too because everything we do um, with money or otherwise flows from who we are in our hearts. So here we are, let's get going. Here are my friends, Dave and Rebecca Van Noppen. Well. Good evening, everybody. I would like to welcome my friends, Dave and Rebecca Van Noppen to A Cup of Hope tonight. We're gonna to share a cup with you guys and a cup with each other. Um, I'm gonna ask you guys, I think Dave and Rebecca, um, you, you guys would be uh, one of the only relationships I have in my life um, that is completely virtual at this point. We've never met in person, <laughs> yes. but uh, we met, uh, through, uh, I think, Facebook, your podcast. Uh, I heard it and somehow made the connection and we started talking. So uh, I've loved getting to know you guys. Would you guys just tell a little about yourselves to our listeners and watchers tonight? You want to go first? I, I can go first. My name is Rebecca. So. I, um, if you listen to the podcast, Let's Talk Money with Dave and Reb, um, my short no name is Reb. Um, I am, what's that? Oh, I, you can call me either. I actually, when I was born, um, my Russian grandfather, uh, said, or Russian Mennonite grandfather called me Reb right off the bat. I grew up as Becky. I've had every name under the sun, but we've gone Becca, with Reb. Wow. Yeah. Becca, Becky, Beck. Yeah. The whole thing. Um, but I moved to Ottawa to go to school at Carleton University a number of years ago. I met Dave uh, through a group that we were in and 29 years of marriage we've celebrated this year. We have five children. Our oldest is 23, our youngest is nine, and I'm currently homeschooling her um, as I have the others. But um, because of COVID, she's back at home with us. So um, David and I are... Uh, owners of a company called More Than Enough Financial. So you can go from there. 
There you go. And I'm a retired automotive mechanic converted to financial fitness coach. Yeah. You might hear some of that story as we talk today, but really um, uh, I'm pretty excited to bring a cup of hope in the area of finances. This has been uh, my passion calling for the last 15 years, give or take a surprise passion and calling, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm Dutch by heritage. So I come by the frugal part of money pretty, pretty normally you through mean, my DNA. You mean stingy. Yeah. Just, uh, just frugal. Okay. Wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the frugal part of me, but uh, to, to really see um, kind of God at work in the area of finances and to be able to, to bring a, a cup of hope that it's just fun. So we're happy to be here. So, um, what you touched on it a little bit, Dave, what made you guys make this leap from a, a completely different life to wanting to help people with money? Uh, try and keep that story relatively short, but the, the, the real short version is uh, I was working as a mechanic in a family business, uh, automotive business, and we were reorganizing as my younger brother was coming on board and my father was retiring. And as the reorganization happened, uh, God really made it perfectly clear to both Rebecca and I that I was not part of that reorganizing, that the, the business was going to go and I needed to exit at that, that point. So we exited the business not really knowing what the next uh, season was going to look like. Uh, we, the Lord had given us the verse out of Hebrews that said that Abraham, though he did not know where he was going, left his family and obeyed and went. Obeyed and went. And we were on this obey and went journey for about, uh, I would say it was about four months or three and a half months where we absolutely didn't know what it looked like. Uh, although there was uh, some, some words that the Lord had put in our heart. And so about uh, six months before I left the business, uh, I was at a business conference. Uh, it was a Christian businessmen's conference. And uh, the gentleman prayed there for me. And he's, we were in a, actually a breakout session on prayer and intercession in your workplace, what it can look like. And he said, well, we're we're talking about prayer. Why don't we pray for some of you here? And he said, uh, you know, I just think the Lord's telling you that you've got more than enough, Dave. And, you know, I was like, okay, cryptic words from a guy I don't know. It like, it's just kind of like, oh, okay, whatever. But it, it resonated in my heart. And uh, yeah, you know, so. And we really, he came home and he's like, I have no idea what this means. And I'm like, well, he's given us more than enough. So it, the word came up often enough. And um, in the end, he called a friend, said, I have someone who we know, and it actually literally wasn't us. You know how someone people call and say, you know, I've, I've got this friend who's in trouble and it's them. Well, it actually wasn't us. We were calling our friend, Lynn Fraser, who was doing financial fitness seminars, who was a mortgage broker and help people financially. And she, Dave said, I, we got a friend, what can we do? Do you do coaching? Do you do accountability? Anything like that? And she said, no, but oddly enough, I have, I have this dream, this vision for some kind of coaching, financial coaching company. And I have the logo and I have the name. And Dave's like, oh, well, what's the name? And, and she's like, well, more than enough. And the moment she said it, David knew, ah, you know what? Maybe we should go for coffee. And literally, I know it, it's this, there's way more to the story of what God had to take us through to get to that point, even what God was doing. We had always said yes to the Lord, but sometimes, I don't know if you guys have discovered that in your own lives, but when you say yes, there are some character issues that have to come along that at yes. And this journey has been about some character refining in our lives and continues to be so. So that when our yes is yes, it's just not an external yes. It's a whole life, 100% yes. Yeah. So that's really been the journey. So yeah. basically he started helping Lynn and they designed, a co he did coaching courses and then the rest is history basically. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, the, the financial journey there, we went, you know, close to 18 months without any real pay uh, on very little savings. Uh, again, 
you know, God, uh, the glory really goes to God. He said, when you leave the business, you're not taking anything with you, leave everything. So, you know, this is a family business and there was, you know, shares and all of that stuff. And we just said, okay, it all stays there. This is what the Lord said. And, and so a good part of our journey and a good part of our, our learning of who we are and how we relate to money is really baptism by fire. It was like, okay, <laughs> you have no source of income. You, I've never risen, written a resume. I was 40, almost, I was 40, I don't know, 12 35, years ago. whatever it was. 12 minus 50, 38. Okay, so I was 38, never written a resume, never been unemployed since I was 10, always had a, you know, a place to go, always making money and, and realized that, oh my goodness, never been here before and, and really relying on the Lord's provision every single day. Um, we have a great, we had a great story. We, we knew, I, I know we have way more things to talk about, but this is a really great, hopeful story. We had... Um, we had a little bit of savings RSPs that we've been putting away over the years, and that's predominantly what we lived on. But we knew we were, you'll hear us talk about this. We were facing our financial situation. We were anticipating when we were going to run out of money. And so we spent a weekend with the Lord praying, and we called our team of people because we have a, te a team of people who pray for us. And we called them and we said, we're praying about this. Should Dave go back to work? Should he still coach part-time? Should What should we do? Cause he was starting to coach at that point and, and taking in a little bit of income, but not enough for us to live on. And, um, and it was just really clear on everybody's sense that we were just to keep going because anything else would be a distraction from the call. So the next day, literally we got a call from a, from friends of ours and we hadn't been telling people about our financial needs at all. We, the Lord had really, we sensed, we just keep it between the three of us. And we did that the best we were able. And she said, how are you guys doing? I said, oh, well, you know, we're fine. She goes, no, how are you financially doing? I'm thinking, well, you know, for the next couple of weeks, I've got groceries, we're good, you know? And she said, no, 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 no. She goes, how are you doing really? I'm like, and then I said, well, why are you asking? And she's like, well, my husband and I were praying separately for you this weekend. And we really feel like we need to pay for your mortgage this year. The rest of the year, we're going to pay your mortgage every month. Wow. And I just start crying because that was enough every month to give us breathing room where we didn't like, it still makes me cry. Because <laughs> that week, my sister-in-law came to visit and she said, you know what? Why don't we go to Costco? I said, I have groceries. No, no, no. We're going to get two carts to Costco. You fill it with anything you want <laughs> and I'll pay for it. So we come back with this van full of goods and the kids thought it was Christmas morning. Like, <laughs> cause we got stuff we normally didn't buy, you know, and it was Dave came home and we had it all piled in the living room. Right. Because for all these months, we'd be like, well, I don't know if we should get fishy crackers. They're not really a necessity, you know, like that's how we were living. And I was trying to figure out how do you do this? How, how do you think like, how did we pay for this? Yeah. So it, it was just that kind of those kinds of answers. We haven't always had those answers. Sometimes they were but, last but minute, week... just in time answers, but that week <laughs> was amazing. And that, and you know, it was really just a confirmation of the journey of God took care of our shelter and God took care of our food and he does it through people. Yep. You know, it didn't magically show up, you know, the, the, the money tree didn't pop out of the backyard <laughs> and we start, you know, harvesting money leaves, you know, none of that, but he did it through people who were obedient. He did it through people who sacrificed. He did it through people who, who cared and loved. And, and, you know, that's a big part of the message in the ministry of more than enough is sometimes we're in that place of need. Sometimes we're in the receiving, you know, we, we do everything within our power to be able to, to say, Lord, you've, you've called us. We're on this journey. This is, this is what it's going to take to, to uh, care for the family that he's given us. I mean, we didn't regret having kids. We didn't regret buying the house that we, we felt. All of those things were things that the Lord knew ahead of time yeah. that was going to happen. We had five kids and a, and a mortgage. We just moved into a kind of upgraded the house a year before that. He knew that I was going to leave the business. He knew that, you know, and so for us, it was, 
it was really the confirmation of the Lord supplies shelter, the Lord supplies food, and he does it through his, his people. people. And so a big part of our message is, is to go, when you're in need, to be able to receive that and to go, wow, like that's, a, that's an incredible, in a sense, gift from God through his people and when you have more than enough when you when you you have uh, especially in this covid season we're starting to see a, a much greater spread between the people who have not really been affected financially in fact may have been able to save money or create more stability um and the people who are in desperate need and and you know to the point of of not being able to to make payments on the mortgage or not being able to to buy groceries yeah. and so for those of us that are in the place of more than enough there's an encouragement to open your eyes and to to say look around mm -hmm. you know love your neighbor tangibly cool and for those that need to receive it then you need to say well and humble yourself and receive it because this is a gift from god mm -hmm. cool you guys talk about financial fitness um, what does that mean? Um, cause I think probably everybody has a little different picture of what that means. Um, maybe what are a few things that that means when you guys use the, that term? Well, I'll jump in first. Financial fitness looks different for Reb, for me <laughs> and for Neil. <laughs> Neil, you're on that side of the screen on our, right? <laughs> <Got that right. laughs> and, and to kind of recognize that you know, you might say my goal in my finances is to, you know, using the metaphor, run a marathon. Like that's my goal and that's Dave's goal. And that, you know, that's going to look way different than maybe Reb's goal, who just simply wants to feel healthy, you know, wants to have energy at the end of the day, but really doesn't have this drive to, to, to run 50 kilometers or 26 miles or whatever, whatever the marathon is, you know, uh, so it, it might look different for the two of us and it might look different again for you, Neil. Um, what we do know is, is there are some, some key identifiers that we know what unhealthy or unfit looks like, and it may be easier to identify and say, you know, there are these levels of fitness that we can attain to, but there is kind of a bottom line here where, uh, you know, if you've got these things going on in your life, then you might want to address those in terms of fitness. Uh, Rev, you want to? Well, I, I mean, um, we were to actually, we went on a walk this morning and we were talking about this question because it's very interesting, Neil. Not many people ask us what that means. Mm. It's, we assume we know what it means. So then we started talking about it. You know, for, for me, going for a nice walk, um, you know, uh, this weekend in the Gatineau's, if you guys have heard of the Gatineau's, the leaves are incredible out here. And so we go for a walk and, you know, um, and some people can do the walk really well and some people can't. They're huffing, you can't talk during the walk. And I, we were just talking about that this morning. You know, what, you know, if someone says to you, let's go for dinner and you say, oh man, I have no money. I can't go out for dinner. Well, you go out for dinner anyway, and you put it on your credit, and then you're going to pay, you know, that's like walking up a hill and huffing and puffing, right? But if you've been putting money aside just for occasions like that, and someone says, do you want to go for dinner? And you're like, yeah, let's do it. Because you've already, you know, that's fitness. That is being prepared. That's giving yourself capacity. I said to Dave, if I want to be walking in 10 years at on my 61st birthday, I've got to be walking every day now. So yeah. fitness, it, it's for the long haul. It's not just for the moment, just so I can get to Disney or just so I can buy a boat. It is for a long-term plan. And I think the one of the keys of financial fitness is getting aware of where you're at financially. Okay. And and during COVID, we've talked to uh, our friends at the b bankruptcy trustee company in Ottawa. One of them was on the radio show and she said, now is the time to get aware of where you're at. If you've never done it before, get a bird's eye view of where you're at financially, your debt, and take an honest look at it because that's the hardest thing to do. Right. So, and there's two things. I mean, we have this acrostic that we, you know, 
if you listen to the podcast, financial awareness creates empowerment. It's, it's a bit of a mantra in our, in our world because there's just so many things about being financially aware that are beneficial. And this doesn't mean, again, it doesn't mean you have to set the pace for, I'm going to run a marathon. That might not be you. And that's totally mm -hmm. okay. But you still need to be financially aware. And the, the other word that, that we use a lot is intentionality. If you aren't intentional with your money, then, you know, it's almost like your money has a little bit of attitude. It'll just get up and leave. Like, you know, <laughs> if you don't tell it to behave, if you don't give it a spot or a name, it just, it's just gone. And, and you know, that's a, 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 an observation that we laugh at sometimes, but we go, wait a minute, where did that 30 or where did that 20 buck go that I put in my wallet a week ago? Well, yeah. I don't know. Well, yeah. I didn't give it a name. I just put it in my wallet and somehow it snuck out of there. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how that happened. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and it's even more powerful with debit cards because okay. the debit card sneaks away from you. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, Oh yeah. Tap here, tap there, tap here. And you're all of a sudden like, I have no idea how the bank account got empty. So and, I, and it's, I mean, it's so easy um, to, to do right. Like again, there's just so many things that are cool things to spend money on. Yeah, like, yeah. it's you know, a thousand cuts, right? You know, it's it's just you know, and, and even more so when we we get have the fun of shopping online and it gets delivered right to your door. And you know, we have a, again a little rule around uh, spending. You know, you don't do it when you're hungry, when you're tired, when you're angry, uh, or when you're lonely. H A L T. So hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. Uh, spells halt, halt spells halt and you go wait a minute maybe i should halt my spending when i'm feeling these emotions because yeah. the reality is is we know that money is a bit it's the heart issue it is about what's going on in our heart okay i want and, to ask you guys about that what yeah, what so, are those heart issues because you guys don't just talk dollars and cents with people here's how to here's how to make more money or here's how to save more money those are things that come up but it's the internal stuff that leads to the, the external problems or even success. So what are the hard issues that you guys find yourselves dealing with a lot? <laughs> we actually, again, we went for a walk to talk about this because we're like, okay, how, what, do you, what do you narrow it down to? David right. and I have written a, a series of workshops called Unleashed where we deal with the heart issues. So if you come for coaching with us and you want the workshops, it's once a month, you're in a small group and now we're doing it online. So it's been, but we talked and we actually went to one of the core ones is comparing ourselves to our neighbors okay. because of the, the Would that I be mean, there's, the, there's a lot of issues, but when we start, we have a workshop called comparing, um, uh, coveting and contentment and coveting is in, in scripture, uh, what we understand in the 10 commandments, coveting is the one thing that God gave to Israel that dealt with the thought pattern. All the others are external. Don't murder, don't steal, worship me, obey your parents. That coveting is an internal thing. And that coveting will lead to stealing, murder, uh, speaking against your neighbor. It leads to the four, four others. Mm -hmm. So it's really important. Now, coveting is, is exactly like you want your neighbor's Mercedes. Like that Mercedes is the one you want. But there's relatives, there's envy, there's jealousy. So if you're out and you work hard, and your neighbor has a big brand new boat and you're like, but I work hard. I deserve a big brand new boat. So out you go and you're not facing your finances. You're just figuring out, well, we got to get a boat and now we need the gas to run the boat. We need the insurance. We need the vests. Um, now we need skis and wakeboards and all of that stuff. And then it becomes this big thing all because you felt like you deserved, or I feel I deserve that boat that my neighbor ha also has, whatever my thing is. And yeah. it might be yours. Your listeners might be struggling with that. And it does come back to discontent mm. over where I'm at with what I have. Mm. And so one of the antidotes that we talk about all the time, which so many people talk about is gratitude. Mm. Just give thanks. Mm. Give thanks. 
give thanks for what we have because you may think you're not rich, but most Canadians are even on lower incomes. We're the richest, some of the richest people in the world because we live yeah. in one of the richest countries in the world. Have you ever uh, seen I, the video? I, I, oh, sorry. Have you ever seen the video? Uh, I don't know, probably out there on YouTube floating around somewhere, but where a guy wakes up in the morning and like he's completely gift wrapped and his bed is wrapped like a gift. And he's like, what's going on? And he breaks his way out and he comes out of his bedroom and everything he sees like light switches, the kitchen sink where the water comes out, the fridge, they all have like bows and ribbons on them or they're gift wrapped completely. He goes outside and his car is gift wrapped. His children wake up and come out and say, what's going on? And they're completely wrapped in wrapping paper. And it, you know, just the kind of the blunt reminder that, there's so many things in all of our lives we're just taking for granted without ever stopping to give thanks. And, and the, the push of, of culture seems to drive us that it's, there's never enough. We always have to go for more, more, bigger, better, more stuff and build bigger barns like the story Jesus told. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, the, and the other part of that really is, is, is being able to truly celebrate someone else's, gifts and their victories mm -hmm. right so when you when when you go to that gratitude when you go to that thankfulness and you see someone else succeeding you know our human nature you know kind of rises up and says oh you know they're doing better than me i better i better go do better or i better you know and so much of the messaging that we receive just almost unconsciously is is giving us that message that well if you know if neil you're doing better than me then I better pull up my bootstraps and, and get out there and, and to be able to say, wait a minute, I can truly celebrate your success, Neil, and, and you know, how you're, you're bringing hope to, to your congregation. And, and, and I can just celebrate it. I can enter into it. I can encourage you at it. And, and I don't have to feel like I'm, uh, I'm in competition with you. Uh, yeah. And that, that is freedom. You know, when we talk about, you know, hope and freedom, that's two of the messages that, that we really, you know, we bring hope and hope for today and freedom for tomorrow. And when we, that freedom for tomorrow is right there. Like it allows us to just celebrate those gifts, those people, those to, to just enter into that, whatever that looks like. Yeah. And, and in the midst, I mean, maybe you guys aren't experiencing it out your way in the same way we are with COVID. But it's a real challenge for us mentally to be entering winter thinking that we can only see the people in our household again. And so that gratitude piece and the contentment is something that we're trying to encourage each other with daily. Like it is, and, and don't be fooled, it's a fight. Jesus said that you can't serve God and you can't serve mammon at the same time. You can't serve money and stuff. Jesus said it. He said it thousands of years ago. And you think, you know, they didn't have the flashy cars that we have. They didn't have all that stuff. But obviously, it was still a heart issue because Jesus said, you can't do it. And it's a fight. And if you struggle with it, tell somebody, I want stuff. I, I say to him, I say, yeah, I like my jewelry or my things and they they have a heart attachment for me can you help me like that's a hard thing to talk about because we feel shame and embarrassment we feel like as christians we're supposed to be good stewards we're supposed to have it all together god made it all i'm supposed to you know talk about being marrying to a dutch family that's frugal well they have money issues too it looks different but they do they have money issues around that frugal <laughs> <laughs> like mm, what is that yeah. anyway you know i'm like i'm flamboyant i'm definitely he's like turtle i'm like and like let's just go right i'm like all in or i'm not in so yeah. it's our personalities as well and our you know we haven't we haven't ventured there but there are personalities with money our personalities relate to money. Mm -hmm. So that's a heart issue. And who are you? And are you as a spouse expecting your, your partner to be like you? And that we see a lot. The expectation on each other is really huge um, when you don't understand where your spouse is coming from. But that, that's a whole other, you know, 40 minute mm -hmm. discussion on talking oh, about minimum. Money with your spouse. Minimum. <laughs> so, um, it seems like all we talk about these days is how much COVID has changed everything. But 
what have you guys seen? Uh, I don't know if, if generally we can kind of talk about that issue, but how has it changed the landscape for people financially? What things have changed a lot and might never be the same again? And maybe what things haven't changed that mm -hmm. this is always going to be true. This is always going to work, that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, I think there's a story that that uh, one of our one of our clients shared with me that that really um, made it aware to me kind of what happens within the COVID environment. So this client was uh, she's a esthetician. So obviously, COVID hit. She's getting like one hour a week, you know, like the, there's there's basically no job there. She's uh, she's in her mid fifties, so she's quite content. She, you know, life was pretty good working, uh, you know, the hours that she wanted to work as an esthetician, but needing that income to to pay the bills, just the same as as we all were. So, you know, um, and it was just a beautiful thing. She told me that one of her clients called her up a couple weeks into COVID and said, um, you know what, I know we can't come see you and I'm going to be you know, there the minute that I can be, but I recognize that you're, you don't have a job and you're probably, you know, maybe you're getting COVID, maybe you're not, or sorry, maybe you're getting served, maybe you're not, it doesn't really matter. I, I wanted to just check in to see how you're doing and we're going to send you some money. And wow. so over the next number of months, she just sent money over to this. And, and it's really her esthetician. It, it's a friend. It's somebody that she cared about but the the two things that that really struck me one is, is you know my our client she didn't have a great need uh, i mean obviously she's stressed and trying to figure out how it goes but there there was definitely some helps there but then for this client to say you know my income hasn't been interrupted and so she intentionally kind of looked around and went wow, these people, and I don't know if she did it for other people or just this, this client, but she looked around enough to say, wow, there's other people that are hurting and I have the ability to help. And, and I can do that to somebody that I care about. I think one of the things that we do see that hasn't changed is that the Canadian family was in trouble before COVID. And if we've seen anything that, it, I mean, um, our, the the leader i always i can never pronounce his name properly sanji uh judgment singh uh yes thank you um the leader of the the democrats after the the throne speech a few weeks ago he just said what's happened is it's just shown us the weaknesses that exist that's so good it, it was a great quote and it's just stuck with me and it, ha it it's just shown the Canadian weakness. So if families are struggling, it's just brought that more to the surface yeah. and we get phone calls and we may be even getting more phone calls for coaching at our office because what we do at more than enough is financial coaching. We have a, a team of coaches that, that walk with people like a fitness coach would walk with, with folks and, what hasn't changed is a quick fix desire. So, okay, you can come for coaching. You'll meet with a coach. You're going to meet every month. You're going to come and fill out a financial assessment. We almost lose half the people there because the, the, it's hard work. You have to get aware of where you're at financially. And that has not changed. It's just brought it to the surface. Please give me a quick fix. Can we consolidate our debt? Can we, um, the bankruptcy trustees said the week before COVID hit in March, it was their busiest week ever at their, the next week after a serve was announced, everything dropped off. It was the quietest they'd ever seen their business. So it, yeah. the, the, the relief the government has given, but, but there are some serious, what has it shown us? We, it has shown us that our government, our, financially, we as a nation are in trouble financially, right? I mean, that's not a very hopeful thing to think about, but that's the reality of it. How are we, so our encouragement still, at the beginning of COVID, I said to Dave, so how do we talk to people? And he said, well, 
The Bible hasn't changed in thousands of years. The principles are still there. If you can pay down your debt now and you have a little bit of extra because of CERB, get on it. If you can build your emergency cushion, get on it. If we talked about that, it's been a burden for us because we've been saying it. If Canadians had three months of emergency cushion so that they wouldn't have to rely on anybody, that they would have like the 15 grand or whatever somewhere in a savings account and they could have lived off of that for three grand. Every Canadian family, we wouldn't have had to go to the government for CERB right away, right? Like it doesn't mean that we're not going to need help, but the accountants we're talking to that we see that there's trouble coming at, for businesses because you can hold off for six months, but can you hold off a year? Can these, can the entertainment in industry, like there's, there's just a lot of folks that have lost jobs. We're in a bit of a bubble in the Ottawa area because of government jobs. So there's so lots of people we talk to who actually, well, they're not driving to work and we've saved a, a bus load of money, just not paying for car repairs and traveling to work because we live outside the city. So that money we've saved. So, you know, a lot of people have saved in those areas, not paying for, for their kids, not activities. going to Starbucks. We talked about that. Not going to Starbucks. You know, you save in all yeah, these Starbucks. different areas. Yeah. But but in the end, I mean, maybe you do more Amazon shopping or online shopping now because of because right. you're home and you can spend it there. But I mean, if I mean, that's a kind of it's before, shown the weaknesses. Yeah, if people had this issue before, it just we we find new ways to go after whatever our medicine was right? Or, or our drug of choice. Right. And if it is shopping, then, then there's, it's never been easier. Um, right. So it really interesting uh, how when you think about it, so much has changed. And yet in this area, it's almost like, you know, a, a, aside from people losing their jobs and we we're not minimizing the exposure that that creates for people and the fear and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But truly, um, what works and what financial fitness is about and, and God's ways of handling money and managing it, nothing changed. Mm -hmm. And they, they work when things are good and the harvest is bringing in, in our area, it's potatoes. When the potato harvest is huge, mm -hmm. God's principles work. And when the harvest goes to rot or the, the crop is small, God's principles have still worked and they, they sustain people through mm -hmm. the, uh, the low and the lean times. Right. But Neil, I do want, I don't want people to think that God is not a God of mercy and grace mm -hmm. because this is the day of salvation. And we have seen it in our own poor financial decisions that God, you seek him out. You may have not had an emergency cushion. You may have consumer debt in the thousands and you're listening to this thinking, well, there's no hope for me. There is hope mm -hmm. because you call out to the Lord and you're in community and you call out to your friends and your neighbors, you call more than enough, you call Neil or your people in your faith community or those you trust. You know, you don't just go tell anybody. You, you ask the Lord, who can you confide in? And you call on the name of the Lord. And we have seen him answer in our poor choices. And there may be some of you guys out there feeling desperate. You take a day at a time with the Lord. And I tell you, he will lead you. He just, he's waiting for you to ask him to help. Mm -hmm. it, it really is such an area of shame and embarrassment for people. When you think, when you're talking about God's mercy, that's the thing I, I think of right away is we, we don't get to experience his mercy unless we sort of open up the book and say, this is, this is what things look like for me. And I've made a big mess and I don't have a clue where to start. And, and our story was very similar and it still can be like we, it's not that we do everything perfect. Now we, we went through a transformation, you know, and over the last five, six years that really changed things for us, but we still make mistakes and we still uh, buy things out of uh, comfort or want more than need, you know, and, and we make some dumb decisions, but, but God's mercy, uh, God's been so good to us and the, the hiding has stopped, I think for us. And, and when we make mistakes, we just kind of say like, Hey, we, we, we've done that too. And, and when, when we tell other people like, 
hey, we've done this dumb stuff and, and God has redeemed it and made things uh, better for us and we're a work in progress, I think people feel free to open up their, their can, too, so to speak, and, and let out some of the, the contents. And like, oh, you did that too? Oh, my goodness. I, I thought that I was the dumb one. And uh, turns out we're, we're, we've all done it. So and I think for those, I'll just throw the one more thing that's yeah. flipping through my head. For those of you who are listening to others' stories and you, you know, maybe feel a little judgy, uh, you know, they're, they're not so good with money, you know, because I've been on that end too. Bring that to the Lord. You got to drop it mm-hmm. or no one will, no one will want to confide in you. Right. And we're all on level ground at the cross. And whether you're better in one area of finances, that's great. And you have some wisdom to impart, that's great. But it's the mercy of God that you have that and the wisdom of God. And that's what I've had to learn. There's a million reasons why people struggle with money and we don't have a clue. We don't really know their story. Mm -hmm. So ask them their story, get them to start talking about their story and where they come from. And, and that's maybe where some of that compassion can come from instead of judgment. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Well, our time is getting away on us here. Unfortunately, when we, st- when we started, you guys said we probably have enough in this list of questions for five hours. Well, we've hit probably close to 45 minutes or so. Um, I'd like to end on just some hopeful notes. Do you have some words of hope that you'd like to share with people who are finding themselves kind of desperate or afraid or feeling shame in their finances? If someone finds themselves there tonight, where should they start? Well, I'm, uh, I mean, Rev, Rev said we're all on level ground. Uh, I mean, going to, to the, the scripture and just, you know, recognizing that, that gift of grace that is for us for, for our eternity, also that same gift of grace is for our now. It's for, it's for the finances that we're in right now. And it's really practical. Um, you know, if there's anything that I've learned more and more and more and continue to learn every day from the Lord is that he's involved in our lives as much as we mm-hmm. invite him in to be, and he's immensely practical. Um, and so, you know, it's like, okay, I don't know what to do with this Lord. Should I turn left or turn right? And, and, you know, do that. And, and, you know, in the area of finances, it's such a tactile, tangible thing. Um, and so there's a part that we can play. There's a part that we can say, you know what, I have this love of really great coffee, uh, but it costs, you know, five bucks a pop and I just, I can't do it. There's all kinds of workarounds. There's all kinds of practical things that often you can, you can actually get your nice coffee and pay three bucks for it. Okay. Like that's the part that we can do. And then there's also the part where you just go, Lord, I'm just going to offer all of this up to you and, and allow him to, to really speak to that and recognizing that the grace is the same in this area. And, and, you know, yes, there's practical parts. You can call Neil, you can code to more than enough. We can, uh, you know, we can have somebody come beside you on that note and we're absolutely happy to do it. That, that's why we exist is to really help point you to the savior and say, he didn't just save our Mm -hmm. souls for eternity. Mm -hmm. He actually wants us to bring heaven on earth now. And that means that these things can be saved right now in terms of finances and the practical part of that. And we have seen him meet people in their journey of debt repayment. Mm -hmm. You know, I say all the time, he paid our debt. And can we start to understand that that includes financial things and we can goof if we don't believe he can help us in our, our, our poor mistakes, then we don't understand the grace of God. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. You know, he will lift up the, the humble in due time, you know, the humble and contrite of heart ask, uh, we can ask God to give us humility in our financial journey. I mean, we still do it when we make mistakes together. I don't know if you, Neil, you and your wife, you know, sometimes 
you just have to say, man, I blew that. Yep. I just, I went, I, I went off track. And, and it's just a giving each other grace. And you can give each other grace in your family, in your church community, hearing one another. God is the God of hope. I mean, that's why we're here. I mean, one of the questions you would ask, how did, how did you get, why are you, why are you passionate about this? Well, we didn't know we would get passionate about it. But in this season, whether it's COVID or other things that are coming down the line globally, you know, he, he, it's the message of hope. He is our hope. Yeah. Awesome. Um, this has been great. You guys, uh, just incredibly encouraging, upbeat and practical and, and godly, uh, stuff for, for everybody listening. If people want to know more about you guys and what you do, what more than enough is about, <laughs> <laughs> Where they can enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about yes, where, where they can go and find more about you guys. Yeah, yeah. more than enough.ca and all our, our contact information is on there. But Neil knows how to get a hold of us too. Cool. I mean, there's just so much content on the website. You know, there's the podcast there, there's you know, link to the YouTube channel, there's uh there's blogs, Rebs, Rebs our blog writer. Um, you know, I mean, quite literally. If you could ingest all of the information that's just on the website and actually apply a tenth of it, you're you're awesome. You're, you're like gangbusters. <laughs> if yeah. you need help doing that, we're that's that's where we can bring somebody alongside. But yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah. We'll, so we'll link that stuff in the comments and stuff for people to be able to uh, find you guys, find your podcast, and we uh, just want to say thanks for uh, coming and hanging out with us tonight for. Uh, Cup of hope. Cup of hope. Cup of hope. Great chat, Dave and Rebecca. Thank you for being here. And um, thank you for reminding us that there's no shame. There should be no shame in the world of money. Because um, if you've made money mistakes, that would make you pretty normal. And if you have money problems, that would also make you pretty normal. All of us go through these things at times, and COVID-19 has certainly exacerbated those things. And we don't want you to lose hope. Um, Proverbs 13, 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when desire comes, it's a tree of life. We hope that you found some hope tonight. And even if you just know, I can reach out to these people um, and just have someone to talk through these things with. It was really interesting to me when we asked, we talked about what has changed, and they reminded us that there are a whole lot of things that have not changed still. The same principles work. Uh, all of us have to have a plan that works in good times and in bad times. You know, money guru uh, Warren Buffett had this quote that said, when the tide goes out, you can tell who's been skinny dipping. And if your plan doesn't work when your income drops or um, a pandemic rolls through, unseen, unthought of before, um, you need help. And there's no shame in that. Do not be afraid to reach out for help. It's the best thing that you can do. All this stuff though does point back to a lot of times there are struggles within our heart um, some of us are struggling maybe tonight with um, greed or envy. Maybe you're trying to keep up with the Joneses. And maybe you're trying to uh, live a life that you can't afford. And uh, we've got to bring that back in check. Whatever your struggle is tonight, we'd love to hear from you. And we believe that whatever your struggle is, the beginning of the solution is a relationship with Jesus Christ where you just acknowledge your sin, you acknowledge your need of him, and you invite him into your life. And you can pray that prayer right where you are at home tonight. And uh, if you don't have a home church, we'd love to have you join us at Woodstock Wesleyan. We have in-person gatherings uh, Sunday morning at 1030, and it's also live streamed on Facebook and YouTube, so you can find us there. Next week, I do not want you to miss what I think is a really important conversation. We're talking with Nick and Elizabeth Graham, and it's about the subject of suffering. Do you know anybody who's been sick and been sick for a long time? Someone who lives with chronic pain, maybe? 
maybe it's you, I would love to invite you to tune in and just hear Nick and Elizabeth's story. They've been dealing with Nick's uh, journey through sickness and uh, two liver transplants and a third one that they're waiting for. Um, they've been through a lot and I just think you will find hope in listening to them, how they hold on, how they maintain uh, their trust in the Lord and how they support each other. It's uh, an inspiring story that they have to share. Also, Nick is quite the little woodworker and he has gotten into this uh, new hobby of making pens. Um, and they're really beautiful. And so I'm gonna give away a pen custom made by the one and only Nick Graham to uh, you. If you will take a second and share this show with people who need to hear hope. And if you'll take a second next week and share the show, the interview with Nick and Beth. I'd love to have that reach as many people as it could and your name will go in a draw and I will deliver you a custom made Nick Graham pen. You will love it. Anyway, it's gonna be a great week and listen, we're done for tonight. So till next week, I hope your cup of coffee is empty but I hope your cup of hope is full.